So in chapter 8, Daniel gets another vision. It's two years from that last vision he had, if you remember, of those wild beasts that he saw. Nebuchadnezzar saw a huge image uh, representing the kingdoms that would come. It was a huge image of gold, the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, stomach and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet partly iron, partly clay. And that was a world governing empires that would come. And he's seeing it from man's perspective and oh, how glorious it would look. Oh, but then another kingdom came after that. What was the fifth kingdom? I'm sorry? I can't hear you. No, 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 the fifth kingdom after the, after the, the feet, partly iron, partly clay. What happened? There was a, a stone that came out of the mountain, right? And crushed the image, ground it to powder. That was the Messiah, Messianic kingdom. That was Messiah's kingdom. That's the fifth kingdom. It's, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will establish his kingdom and he'll reign forever and ever and ever. That was chapter 2, verse 44. But in chapter 3, we saw this image of gold. Silver, bronze, iron that Nebuchadnezzar sees, and really he's seeing it from a perspective of the glory of man. But how does Daniel see it? The vision that God gives Daniel, what does he see? Beasts. Men are beasts, brute beasts. The kingdoms of men are nothing more than the animal kingdom. Isn't that amazing? That, from God's perspective, that's how he sees things, right? And the last beast was a monstrosity, right? The Roman Empire couldn't even be described, this, this beast that came out. And as we get into chapter 8, he's going to go into a little further explanation and understanding for Daniel of the two kingdoms that would arise after Babylon. So chapter 8, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, that's Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, this is 551 B.C., two years after the first vision he had received. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me at the first, the first one two years ago. I saw in a vision, and so it happened while I was looking, that I was in Sushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision that I was by the river Uli. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there, standing beside the river, there was a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns, and excuse me, and two horns were high, but one was higher than the other horn, and the higher horn came up last. What's he talking about? The Medes and the Persians. Okay, so what, the two horns, the kingdom of the Medes, the kingdom of the Persians. What came up first? The Medes. What came up second? The Persians. Which one was greater? The Persians. Now, who, who represented the Persian Empire who conquered the known world at that time? Who? Cyrus. Cyrus. That's right. Cyrus. King Cyrus. Cyrus was the great Persian king. And that's what he's talking about here. And I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, southward, so that no beast could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will, and he became great. And Cyrus did conquer a great amount of territory. And Cyrus was the one who allowed the Jews to do what? Go back and rebuild their temple, right? And amazingly, Cyrus was named in the Bible, where? Isaiah. Shortly after his birth? 150 years before he was born. And it appears that Daniel, the prophet, went to Cyrus with the scroll of Isaiah and said, oh, by the way, God wants to talk to you. 150 years before he was even born, his name is mentioned. That he would be the one to release the Jews to go back back to their homeland and rebuild the city of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And out of the probably better than 2 million Jews that existed in Babylon at the time, they all went back to rebuild the city and the temple, didn't they? They didn't? How many went back? Less than 50,000. Just over 49,000 Jews went back to rebuild the temple. Of all the Jews that could have gone out of Babylon to rebuild the temple. Now, what do you think about this? Why did they stay in Babylon? Life was good. Life was good. They were prosperous. They had secure borders. Hey, life is good. Why, you know, why do I want? No, I don't want to. It's, it's hard to go back there, follow. It'd be hard to do that. Isn't that amazing? Rather than be obedient 
and follow the Lord. They took what was most expedient and comfortable and easy. This describes a lot of Christians today, doesn't it? Yeah. Where does repentance need to really begin? With the unbelievers? No, it needs to begin in the church. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, confess their sins, I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive them their sins, and I will restore their land. Isn't that his promise? But you know as well as I do, and speaking with a couple of folks that I was having, a couple of fellows I was having lunch with the other day, both involved in very large churches, and were just lamenting the fact that the majority of people that they know in their churches just, they say they're Christian, but there's no indication of that in the way they conduct themselves, in the way they act. It's amazing, isn't it? Where does repentance really need to begin? In the house of God, in the church. That's where it needs to begin. Yeah. But it would be an obstacle to their comforts, to their conveniences, to their desires, you see. Mm. That's why they wouldn't go back. Life was good in Babylon. But we're called out of Babylon, aren't we? Come out from among them, my people. Be ye separate unto me. I will be your God and you will be my people. But the call is to come out of the world. Verse 5. Now, verse uh, 1 through 4 describes the bear that we saw in chapter 7, verse 5, the Medo-Persian Empire. From 5 to uh, 8, basically, we're describing the leopard of verse 6 of chapter 7, the Grecian Empire, and it's the belly of bronze, the thighs and belly of bronze. Verse 5, and as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the face surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. He's moving pretty fast, huh? Levitating. <laughs> and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Who's the notable horn on this goat? Alexander the Great. That's right. And he came to the ram that was, had two horns, which I had seen standing by the river. And he ran at him with furious power. And I saw in him confronting the ram, and he, mo and he was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, broke his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one left that could deliver the ram from his hand. So he trampled him to death, gored him to death. That was Alexander. Alexander conquered the whole known world in such a short period of time. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken. And in place of it was four notable horns which came up towards the four winds of the heaven. Now, we, we know that the uh, leopard that represents Alexander there in chapter 7 was described as having four what? Four wings. Yeah, and four, four wings and four heads on the beast. Four wings, four heads. Now, he, he's saying here that the notable horn broke and four more horns came up. And what are they talking about? The four generals that divided up the kingdom of Greece, okay? Now, we're going to talk about a man that rises up out of the one quarter of that empire that was taken over by the Seleucids. And he's an evil man, and in type and symbol and sign, he's a type of the Antichrist. In verse 9, we begin to talk about him. And out of one of them came a little horn. Out of one of the four came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. What's the glorious land? Israel. So he was, he was causing a lot of problems for Israel. And when the, uh, during the period of the, of the Persian Empire and the, and the Roman Empire, um, and the Grecian Empire, which took over the Persian Empire, there would be this battle between the east and the west always, and sandwiched in the middle was poor Israel. So every time the, the Persians would make their, their conquest of the west and 
conquering over the Romans, Israel would suffer for it. Every time the Romans would counter the offensive and they would push the Persians back again through the nation of Israel, Israel would suffer for it. So they, they were a buffer zone, but they're always getting beat up by one or the other. But here, this man, this man was the most brutal and the most wicked. And he was a type of the Antichrist, this one little horn that grew up exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, towards the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. How do we understand that? I'm sorry? Who's behind this man? Who's behind the Antichrist? What's the power behind the Antichrist? Satan. So I think this is an indication of Satan. And Satan exercising his power. And we know that Satan is going to have power to prevail over the saints in the time of the end for a short period, isn't he? Yeah. Those saints, those tribulation saints that are still here. Now, you don't plan on being here, do you? No, I don't, I don't plan on being here. No, 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 no. My bags are packed. I'm ready to go. But he grew up towards the host of heaven, cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Now he's talking about the, the, the destruction of Israel, but I think it has a greater uh, context or meaning in that it's Satan's attack against the church and against the Jews, those tribulation saints and those messianic Jews. Verse 11, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of hosts, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, we know that what did Antiochus Epiphanes do? Yeah, in the, in the Holy of Holies of the temple in Israel, he brought a pig in there and he sacrificed it unto Zeus. And that inflamed some of the Jews who God gave him power to overthrow Antiochus Epiphanes. But why did Antiochus Epiphanes have such a, 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 ooh, such a wicked hatred when he went through Israel and destroyed it the way he did? Kill off so many Jews. Well, when he was making his way to the south, Okay, this, this is the fourth kingdom, the fourth air region, which was formerly the Grecian Empire. So he's making his way down to the south. And what was that, that power to the south? Egypt. Egypt. So when he's making his way down to Egypt, and he was going to try to conquer over Egypt, and he might have been able to do that, but, but someone stopped him. Who stopped him? There was a Roman naval officer. Now, he, he, didn't, he didn't have a force sufficient enough to destroy Antiochus' army. But Rome did. And Rome was a tremendous threat. Oh, he was afraid of Rome. Hmm? And so, like what happened with uh, Keir, what's his name, Keir Starmer? Who's Keir Starmer? UK. UK Prime Minister. What, what just happened to him today, a couple days ago? You don't know? Anybody know? They're talking about he, he and Putin, not he and Putin, him and Biden couldn't stop Putin. <laughs> did you? Oh my did, did you? No, no. Did you see? Did you see? Any, anybody get on uh, come, Amir's web, Telegraph today? No? He had a picture of one of the terrorists that got blown up. You know where he got blown up? He was on the commode. <laughs> No, the terrorist wasn't there. It was just, everything was trashed. <laughs> no, that was so, so Biden and Keir Starmer, the prime minister of England, the new prime minister, very left, very radical, they got together and they were going to decide they're going to send long-range missiles to Ukraine. Until Putin said to Keir Starmer, you live on a very small island. You have no missile defense system. The United States does, and we do, and China does, but you don't. And that very small island that you live on will be completely and utterly destroyed. That's what he told them. You may remember he had 250,000 troops on the border of Ukraine, and he said, look, you've you, you got to stop offering this invitation to the Ukrainians to join NATO, or we're going we're gonna to invade them. They don't mean it. That's what we said, right? They don't mean it. And then what did they do? <sighs> one, one night, one night, everything changed for the Ukrainian people and for the nation of Ukraine, and it'll never be the same again ever. One day. Now, what Putin told Steinberg is that 
You can do this, but you won't have a home to go back to. I'm going to destroy your little island. So what did he do? He said to Biden, we're, we're not doing it. We're, we're not. Unless you do it, you commit to it, okay, but we're not doing it. What did Germany say? No mas. We're not, we're not involved. We, they stopped supplying aid to Ukraine completely. Did you know that? They stopped everything. Why? They're afraid of the threat. So this naval officer, this Roman naval officer, he stops Antiochus, the general of the army, the leader, before he can go and attack Egypt. And they meet in a particular part of the desert, and he draws his sword. And what does this Roman, general, this Roman naval officer do with his sword? He draws a circle around him because he tells Antiochus he needs to go back. You, by the power of Rome, I'm telling you right now, go back. You're not going to attack Egypt. Okay? Well, I, I, I just need some time to think about it. Okay. Whoosh, draws a circle around him. Give me your decision before you leave the circle. That's how much time you have. So he was humiliated, humiliated before all of his other generals, humiliated before his army, but he, he, he was not going to pick a fight with Rome. All of a sudden, you know, he stopped beating his chest. <laughs> That's what happened recently. And so on his way home, he has to pass through Israel. What's he do? Takes it all out on Israel. Vicious, vicious attack upon Israel. Much like, much like what we read is going to happen to the Antichrist, you know. Yeah. When he starts to bring his forces down to destroy Israel, and then he hears a news and a report, remember? What's the report? The news that he hears that causes him to... The kings of the east. Crossing the Euphrates River. Army of 200 million. Who's that? Red China. Red China. Yeah, amazingly. Now, he really wants to take it out on Israel, but he, he, now they meet in the... Plains of Esdraelon, or Megiddo. And they're going to fight one another. But then they decide they have a common enemy. Who's that? Jesus Christ. Jesus is returning at that moment in time when Armageddon was going to take place. And then they want to destroy him. They want to commit deicide. They want to kill God. Can't do it, can they? No, no, no. But this little madman here, he's a type of the Antichrist, type of that man of Satan, right? That man empowered by Satan. He even exalts himself, verse 11, as high as the prince of the hosts. And by him, the daily sacrifice is taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. That, that's when he sacrificed a pig to Zeus there in the Holy of Holies and stopped the Jews from making sacrifice. He was coming against the God of gods. Because of the transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifice. And he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Boy, isn't that what's happening today? Is, is truth not being cast to the ground? And look at how evil and the wicked are prospering today. Doesn't it bother you? Well, just read Psalm 37. Or read Psalm 73. 37, 73, the psalmist both, they're, they're just lamenting the fact that why is evil prospering? Why are they getting away with all of this? It was so perplexing. It was so grievous. It brought such sorrow until, until I saw their end. Every devil gets their due and every saint their reward. Hmm? So this old, Satan, listen, Satan has an expiration date, right? The Antichrist, this is, this is only a short period of time in which he's going to be able to rule, but then God will intervene. But that's what happens to this man. And then I heard a holy one speaking. Verse 13, another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled under? How long is this guy going to be able to do this? And he said to me for 2,300 years, Days, or what's the interpretation there? Evenings and mornings. So one evening, one morning is what? One day. So you divide that in half. So what's he talking about? How many days? 1,150 days. That's how long it's going to last. But then Judas Maccabean, remember the Maccabean revolt? Yeah, they cleansed the temple. That's when you have the celebration of 
Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights. Because there was only enough oil to light the minerah for one day, but it lasted miraculously eight days. That's where they get the Feast of Hanukkah. Verse 15. Now, now remember, all of that, all of that is a type of what the Antichrist, the true Antichrist is going to do. He was just a little Antichrist. There are many Antichrists, but then there is the Antichrist. Right? And now what happened when I, Daniel, verse 15, had seen the vision that was seeking the meaning. I was seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. It's an angel. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. First mention of the angel Gabriel. Now, it's not the first mention of him, the first mention of his name. We saw previously that Gabriel was the messenger, but now we know his name. It's Gabriel. There's three archangels. What are their names? Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Those are the three archangels. And under each of them, it appears that one-third of the angelic hosts are under their charge. A third under Michael, a third under Gabriel, a third under Lucifer. And they're good soldiers. The third under Lucifer went with him in rebellion, didn't they? Yeah. But the third under Gabriel, the third under Michael, they stayed their charge. Now, what are they waiting for? Watch and see it all play out. I mean, people ask me all the time, well, if God is a God of love, and God, why, why, why doesn't he stop it now? All the pain, all the sorrow, why doesn't he stop death? Why doesn't he stop the murders? Why doesn't he stop all the violence? Why doesn't he stop the rebellion? He's God. He can do it right now. If he did it right now, what would we say? You didn't give us enough time. You're not being fair. You give us enough time, we'll create our own utopia. Things are getting better every day, and in every way, things are getting better. Aren't they, beloved? I just don't understand those Christians who have this view that we're in the millennial reign of Christ. Can you possibly believe we're in the millennial reign of Christ? If this is the millennial reign, heaven's going to be very disappointing. <laughs> heaven's not going to be disappointing, is it? No, 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 no. But listen to me, here's what you need to understand. Where did rebellion begin? Where did sin begin? Sin began in heaven. Satan brought rebellion to the earth after man was created. But, but before man was created, rebellion of Satan occurred, right? Read Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28, describing Satan and his rebellion against God. Now, a third of those angels went with him. We don't call them angels today. What do we call them? There's a lot of demonic activity today, isn't there? Hmm, that's interesting because, you know, before the first coming of the Christ, if you, if you go through all of the history of the Jews, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of demonic activity. Then all of a sudden you get into the New Testament and man, these demons are everywhere. And nobody had power. Nobody cast out demons. Nobody dealt with a demonic more effectively than Jesus. Isn't that true? And his apostles after him. But it's interesting that this demonic activity just increased to an exponential point just before the first coming of Christ. You know what's going to happen just before the second coming? Just what we're experiencing Demonic activity is accelerating. You understand that? It's amazing what's happening today. Now, they'll say that people are psychotic. It's, oh, that's a psychiatric problem. Well, there, there's some very serious and legitimate psychiatric problems that people have, but there's a lot of demonic oppression and possession taking place. And there's factors that you can see that, that indicate. What are some of the characteristics of someone who's demon-possessed? What? Well... Yeah. A psychiatric problem, a psychiatric patient hears voices. Oh, okay, but that can ju they can just be deranged. There's some indicators that it's demonic. The men coming out of the tombs in the Gerdanese. What was symbolic? What was what was what was the one of the demonstrations, the manifestations of demonic possession among that man? Well, people cut themselves all the time now. No one could, his brute, he had the supernatural strength. His strength was supernatural. What did the demons cry out that were in him? Jesus! <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Carolyn. <laughs> Jesus, son of man, what would you have to do with us before our time? Supernatural knowledge. No, no, listen, listen, supernatural strength, a supernatural knowledge or understanding that they couldn't possibly have had. Th those are some of the key factors in true demon possession. I'm sorry? Yeah. 
<laughs> now, rare, it's, it's, it's been rare, okay, oh, in past years, but demon oppression and possession is increasing more and more and more. Why? People are opening up their door. How do you open up the door? Occult practices, black magic, pharmakia. Okay, what, what, what do the demons love to get people to participate in? Sexual perversion, right? Sexual perversion, drug use, uh, the occult practices. I indicated my prayer. I just got so grieved. Don't we get grieved when we see all the Hall Halloween decorations in our neighborhood? And it's too early. They're, yeah. Good. <laughs> Halloween is not a harmless day, beloved. Do you, do you know much about it? When I first got saved, someone made me aware that I needed to start looking into it, and I did. It made me nauseous. It made me sick. Do you know how many unrecorded births occur during the year among the Satanists? Satanists will... No, I don't want to talk about it. <clears throat> you know. I think you know what I'm talking about. Okay. As far as we need to go. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, Pastor Red, what you say. Love that boy. So my point. A third of them went with their commander. Lucifer. Two-thirds stayed their charge. Under Gabriel, under Michael. All of the angelic hosts are wondering, who's right? God or Satan? Now, Satan wanted to be self-governing. Satan wanted to rule himself. Satan said, there's no reason why I can't have the knowledge of good and evil and be worshipped like you and be exalted. Now, that was the contest. And then what did he convert, convince our first mother to do? Oh, you can be like God. He, he's just trying to keep you from the knowledge of good and evil so you can be like God. Now, God only wanted him to have the knowledge of good. Good. Don't we wish we could just raise our children in a protected environment and before they become teenagers, God will take them. Wouldn't that be nice? No. Oh. They get angel wings and we send them off. It doesn't happen that way, though. No. No. And we, a man cannot acquire the knowledge of evil without it affecting him, without corrupting him, without having its effect. There's not an invention that we have made that hasn't been used to improve our evil, devilish, diabolical ends. The Internet. What a wonderful thing, right? At your fingertips. But you know the sites that are viewed more often than any other sites. It's amazing. All of the inventions, scientific developments and advances that have been made to improve our ability to destroy one another. Weapons of mass destruction. We can blow the planet up how many times over? You don't need to do it once. All right, so all of the angelic hosts, and let me tell you something, most of the world is in, re in rebellion to God. This whole gender dysphoria, it's all a plan of Satan, just to tell God he doesn't have the right to determine whether a male or female. Who are you? God said, I made them. I created them, male and female. But this rebellion against God and God's governance over our lives is continuing. It's satanic, and it's increased more than ever before throughout the globe. This, the United States is more in rebellion to God's will than ever before. How is it that we have forgotten to stand for the sanctity of life and the sanctity of marriage? And the major, now two major subjects of the scriptures. Jesus and Israel were anti-Christ and were anti-Israel today. Like never before. Who would imagine? Who would imagine such a thing? But it's all that rebellion that we want to be self-governing, self-determining. Now, if Jesus would intervene now, people would say, you just didn't give us enough time. We're making life better and better in every way, in every day. And now we have AI. So Jesus is going to allow the world to go to the place 
where it, it's about to absolutely, completely destroy the planet and everything on it. Matthew 24. Don't remember the verse. Maybe 36. Uh, unless the Lord had intervened, no flesh would be left. In the Greek text, he says, absolutely nothing, nothing would survive. And that's at the moment in which he intervenes. And then he proves to all mankind, to every devil and every angel, who has the right to rule. God. So that's the answer to the question. A lot of people, are, are, they stumble over that question. Well, if God is a God of love, then why? Why? Because we wouldn't believe him. No, we have to learn the hard way. We have to bring the world almost to complete and total destruction. Then he intervenes, and then we recognize he's the savior of the world. What happens towards the end, when all of the world is destroying itself, and he's about to return, what do the, what do the men of the world say? They want to hide themselves in the holes in the ground, the clefts of the rock, and rocks fall on us. They're still in rebellion to him. Isn't that amazing? They curse God. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. And we, listen, we are approaching that time. There was a vote in the UN today. What was that vote for? I'm sorry? Yeah, what was the vote? Right, Israel no longer has a right of self-defense. No right of self-defense. Oh, I forgot, what was it, 241 in favor of Israel not having the right of self-defense and 43, or no, 14, 14 against. 14, and then 43 abstentions. The United Nations is the most corrupt body on the face of the earth. But it's anti-Christ, it's anti-Israel, it's anti-God. We're seeing exactly what the Bible said that that Jerusalem will become a cup of trembling for all nations. And all the nations of the earth will turn against Jerusalem. 243 to 14, that's probably all the nations, isn't it? Yeah. And, and we're, 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 we publicize very loudly, very clearly, we had nothing to do with what's happened in the last two days. Right? Why? We're afraid of the Muslim reaction? Perilous times, beloved. Perilous times. All I say is this. You draw closer to the Lord than you've ever been before in your life, and you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Be anxious for nothing. You believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus said. For in my Father's house are, and I go to prepare you one. And where I go, you know, in the way you know. And if I go, I will come again and bring you unto myself. Isn't that wonderful? You don't need to worry. If you're staying close to the God, you don't need to worry. Don't be a prepper. As I've said so many times before, it's not preserving your life here at all costs. Is it? No. What is it? It's living for Jesus no matter what the cost. It's not preserving your life here at all costs. I don't like it here. Do you like it here? I have a sweet life. We talked about that today, didn't we? We have a sweet life. I have a sweet wife and a sweet dog. I live in a little sweet cottage. But, I, but it's ugly around here, isn't it? So it's living for Jesus no matter what the cost, not living life here at all costs. And so many people, some, you know, who are, the, who are the people that went the craziest at Y2K? Christians. Christians. I don't think they're Christians. They went nuts. Getting ready. I know a pastor that left his church, took all the money he had, bought, you know about this? Bought a track of land, built these barns, and had these vats of grains and then the mills and just him and his, they're going to, wow. I thought the captain's supposed to go down with the ship. None of your flock could do what you did, but you abandoned them. That's what he did. I'm prepping for the end. He, listen, he may have to need to survive in that hole for a while. 
I'm telling you, I, I told these guys, listen, if, if that's your attitude, maybe you're not saved because you're not trusting God. God told me I didn't need to worry about those things. I remember being invited to speak at the pastor's conference in Lake Junaliska just before Y2K. And I spoke on the fact that it's a no-brainer. Don't worry about it. Were you there? And man, did I get crucified after that. I, I had a bunch of guys around me like, like, like killer bees. You know, you're irresponsible. What's the matter? How could you say that? I said, well, I'm just trusting God. I think it's going to be a no-brainer. It's a non-event. Stop worrying about it. You know, do you read the Bible about what's coming? If we pulled all of our resources, everybody shows up on Sunday morning, if we all pulled all of our resources, can we insulate us from what's coming? No. No. But you stay close to Jesus. Who knows what he'll do? Yeah. Who knows? And whatever he has to have, whatever he deems necessary for you or I to go through, he'll give us the grace to go through it. He'll give us everything we need. He does. I'll build 812. I'll build bigger barns. Oh, soul, you're in need of nothing. You prepared for everything. Oh, I'm such a wise man, a thoughtful man. Oh, yes. Who is that? The fool. Now, it wasn't a parable, because Jesus is naming names, right? And he said, don't you know, that very night, they said to him, you fool, this night, they demand your soul. Who are the they? The demons. The demons that demand his soul. Bezos just bought a billion-dollar bunker house. Do you see that? Huh? He thinks he... <laughs> <laughs> he, he, listen, the devil. <laughs> all these people think that the devil and evil is going to protect them. The devil has one ultimate goal: the destruction of everybody. Oh, he may use you for a time. You remember those fellows that all turned against Daniel, plotted against him, used the legalized or politicized the justice system, had Daniel falsely accused, sentenced, judged, incarcerated, thrown in the lion's den. What happened to Daniel? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> he, he had a party down there. You know, he, he stayed nice and warm, sleeping with a couple cats. You know? <laughs> and then the next morning when Nebuchadnezzar, or not Nebuchadnezzar, who was it? Yeah, was it? No. No. It was uh, Darius. Darius took him out of the pit. What happened to the others? And who destroyed them? The lions. Satan's ultimate goal is the destruction of everyone. You can, listen, you can work for him for a little while, but that guarantees you nothing. Nothing. Eventually, like Delilah, what's he going to do? He'll turn on you. Like Delilah did Samson. Hmm. What was his father's name? Samson's father, you know? No. Noah? No, Samson. Okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a clue. I'm giving you a hint to the answer to the question I told you to find out already. Okay? You got it? All right. So I was seeking the meaning, and Gabriel came, verse 17. And so he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid to fell on my face. And he said to me, now, that would be your reaction if you see an angel, right, Gail? We talked about that the other day. You know, if an angel showed up, and it ain't going to be a girl. There's not a single girl angel that we see in the Bible, is there? All the angels that are in the Bible, what are they? And when you see one, what's your reaction going to be? Yeah, you'll need to change your pants. Your knees will knock, right? You start shaking all over. Listen, they're, they're to be feared. They're not these cute little cherubim that you see, you know, these little angels that people put on their mantle. And No. No, 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 no. Daniel was used to being around kings. He was around Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, I mean, Belteshazzar. You know, it, it, Daniel's an old statesman by now. You're not going to fear him. He's not going to fear anyone. But look what takes place when he sees this angel. And he came near where I stood, and I was afraid, and I fell on my face, and I said, and he said to me, understand, son of man, 
that the vision refers to the time of the end. When's it going to occur? In the last days, the latter days, the time of the end. What's he talking about? The Antichrist, when the Antichrist comes and he desecrates the temple. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground and he touched me and, I, and stood me upright. And he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation for at the appointed time, the end shall, the end shall be. The time of indignation. Does it remind you of any other Old Testament reference? The indignation. Isaiah 26. Go there. Yeah, second coming. Where are you? Verse 20, exactly. Isaiah 26, 20. No, go to 19. Yeah, start at 19. A promise of the resurrection. Job believed in the resurrection. All this book of the Bible. Here, Isaiah is giving us a promise of the resurrection here. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out her dead. All the dead are going to be raised to life, right? Some to everlasting life, and some to torment and judgment for an eternity, right? Right? Now, look at verse 20. Very um, cryptic. Mystery. Come, my people, enter your chambers. Shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is passed. What indignation? The wrath of God. God's wrath. That's exactly what he's talking about there in Daniel, in chapter 8. And that's where, uh, Isaiah 26. Verse 20 and 21. Until the indignation is passed, and it tells us what it is. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. So Jesus Christ is going to return. He's going to come out of his place. And it's the wrath of Jesus Christ that the world is going to experience. In just two judgments of the wrath of God, half the population is gone. That's four billion people who are having today. Four billion people. But come up, my people, and hide yourself as a little while in the chamber. Who's, that? Who's he talking to there? The bride. It's the rapture. That's an allusion to the rapture. That being hid in what chamber? The bridal chamber. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Now listen, that's what I'm trusting. That, hey, I'm prepping myself. I'm prepping myself for the king's return. I'm prepping myself because he's going to take me. And maybe it's like Burger King. You know, Jonathan, you get it your way. You want to prepare to stay? Well, maybe you're going to stay. <laughs> you want to prepare to go? Maybe you're going to go. <laughs> go, back, go back to Daniel 8. We'll wrap it up. The interpretation of the ram, and so the ram which you saw, having two horns, were the kings of Mede and Persia. And the male goat, the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that was between its heads, the first king, Alexander. And as the horn, the broken horn, and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. It's not the same power and authority that Alexander had, but it would be uh, broken up into the four kingdoms by his four generals. In the latter days of the kingdom, at the end times, now we're talking about Antichrist again, when the transgressions have reached their fullness, a king shall arise with fierce features who understand sinister schemes, evil. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. By whose power? Satan. This man, listen, this man is going to be empowered by Satan more than any other man on the face of the earth that has been influenced by the devil. This is going to be the devil incarnate, the devil in the flesh. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He, does, he shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. He's coming against the Jews and he's coming against the tribulation saints at that time. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. 
posterity. He shall even rise against the princes of princes. Who is that? Jesus Christ. But he shall be broken without human hand. Yeah, no, no human means going to take him down. Who's going to take him down? Yeah. Just by the word he speaks. Who's going to take down Satan in the end? Who's going to, he's going to get body slammed to the earth, right? Because he's in heaven right now accusing the brethren. But he's going to get body slammed to the earth. But when he goes to the abyss, who puts him in the abyss? Michael. Michael. Yeah, you know who Benaniah was? You know who Benaniah was? Who was Benaniah? He was one of David's mighty men. He became Solomon's fixer. He was the fixer. <laughs> Benaniah. <laughs> David gave Solomon a list. He said, uh, you know, they got to go. Benaniah, they got to go. He was the fixer. Michael. Michael's the fixer in heaven. You know, God's going to say, it's got to go. And Gabriel's going to one. It's going to be so glorious for the rest of the angelic host to see when, when Michael comes down, not Gabriel, Michael. Michael comes down because he's the mighty angel. He's the worrying angel. Michael comes down and he gets a hold of Satan and he casts him into the abyss. Wraps him up. Body slams him. Has to tap out. <laughs> yes. He shall be broken without human hand. And the vision of the evening and the mornings which were told or is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future, the end times. And I, I, Daniel, fainted. I was sick for days. Afterwards, I arose and I went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Do you know that there are things that Daniel received in visions and signs and revelation from God that he never really understood? But you know what we do? We, we can make such a clear understanding and interpretation of so much of what Daniel wrote that he, he couldn't. Why? Why? Yeah, go to the end of the book. The end of the book. Twelve nine. Go to twelve eight. Chapter twelve, verse eight. You there? Okay, you there now? Okay, twelve eight. Although I heard, this is Daniel speaking, I did not understand. And then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? How do I understand all this? And he said to me, Go your way, Daniel. Chapter twelve, verse eight. Where are you? Oh, I'm at the end of Daniel. No, I... Boy, I mean... See, you know... See, it's not just me. No, no, no. All right, all right. The, the end of the book of Daniel. Daniel. The end of Daniel. Ch Ch Daniel 12. I'm, I'm making a point that Daniel didn't understand what he wrote. Never did, okay? But you and I are. Why? Because it's the time of the end. Right? But look what it says in the end of the book of Daniel. Okay? Yeah. In, in verse 4 of chapter 12, he says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. So it won't be understood until the end times. Guess what? We're there. We understand it. For many shall run to and fro. I mean, knowledge or travel throughout the world will increase at an exponential rate. It surely has today, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, and in, in just the last hundred years, look at the advances that have made in travel. Right? And then he says, knowledge shall increase exponentially. Now, we're in the age of information. There's no doubt about that, is there? No. He And, and with was being revealed to Daniel is that the secrets of his visions and his dreams will be understood at the end times when men will travel throughout the globe at incredible rates of speed, that knowledge shall increase exponentially. But look at, uh, go down to verse 8. Although I heard, I did not understand. And then he said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Tell me, Lord. 
And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until, until the end, the time of the end. Here's where we are. For many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Isn't it amazing the massive ignorance that exists today with regard to the word of God and the truth? Like never before. Fewer and fewer and fewer people really do understand the scriptures. And, and Mike, we were talking about being in the apostate age on Sunday night, weren't we? Most churches today are apostate. They're not the church. They don't teach the Bible any longer. They don't know the Bible. Hmm. Verse 11, but from that time, the daily sacrifice is taken away. The abomination of desolation is set up. There shall be 1,290 days. Now he's talking about the Antichrist going in the temple of the temple in the holy of holies of the rebuilt temple and proclaiming himself to be God. And he said, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you, Daniel, go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise in your inheritance at the end of days. Don't worry about it, Daniel. It's not for you to It's not for me to say. <laughs> not for you to know, Daniel. What's going to happen after 1,235 days? Is that what I said? Yeah, 1,290 days, and then blessed is he who comes to the 1,335th day. What's happening there? 45 days of what? Yes. Yes. God is judging. He's separating the goats from the sheep, the wheat from the tares. He's displacing from this earth, from the, for the rest of eternity, those who don't belong here. It's his kingdom. And there's only one way into the kingdom. Surrendering to the king. Now, we won't be here. That's not us. We've already been taken up. Isaiah 26, 20. Come up, my people. Enter your chambers. Hide yourself as a lure for a little while until the indignation, the wrath of God is passed. Amen? Did we finish eight? We did, didn't we? Hallelujah. Okay. Shall we stand? Jonathan, you got a closing song? Pay attention to the news in the morning. We might be surprised.